Uh, thank you, everyone. So, is it me or Python memory management? Today, I'm going to talk about Python memory management, as it was said three times already. And sometimes, when we build up our application, we start to run and everything goes well. And after some time, we start to see some performance decrease. And then we want to understand the causes of that. And today, we're going to go try, try to dive in some of these issues and try to get some answers. My name is Liza Shoa, and I'm here with Yulia Barabash. We are both uh, cloud engineers at North Cloud. We provide, uh, we work with different cloud providers. We provide cloud solutions, and our daily life we work a lot with Python. And sometimes we face issues related to our code performance. So let's talk about performance. But before we dive in, in the computing world of performance, let's try to understand what's performance in the human world. So I have a, here a fictional character called Bob. I guess, I hope there is no Bob out there, but if it's not you. And Bob wants to be an athlete. There are some things that could perhaps affect Bob's performance in while, although Bob knows the technique, knows how to swim, there are some stuff that could happen in external environment that could affect him. For example, maybe he can't sleep, he will have a talk at Aero Python. Maybe the, bad, the weather is bad, not like great today, and could affect his health. Maybe he's low in vitamin D. And maybe he's not sticking to his diet. So here's just like an understanding that uh, he's not taking care of his uh, hardware, he's not taking care of his body, and he could affect his performance. Although, during the execution, he could run as well. Good. So, a lot of times when we talk about software and when we talk about Python, and there will be great talks uh, today and by the end of this conference about optimization with Python. And we always try to save that microseconds and trying to find like these little times to save it. But we should not forget that there is no software without hardware. And all Python, they li uh, Python lives inside our, our laptops and computers, and the performance depends on the hardware. But let's try to understand some of the components of hardware, and specifically the uh, communication between computing units and memory units, for example. So let's go over some computing units, uh, components of hardware. So first of all, I will talk about computing inuts, units which are responsible for the execution of operations. A lot of times when you're trying, uh, going over interviews, they show uh, code and they try to uh, uh, ask you to check if the code is faster than the author just based on the code instruction. And as well, like, but computing in it is also related to the speed of the instructions uh, in execution. Some of the types of computing inuts would be CPU. The CPU is known as the brain of the PC. It is very good for serial process. It has low latency and can do a handful of operation at the same time. Uh, and it has a couple of cores. But we, right now, is also a lot of trend on GPU, which is graphical process uh, units, we, uh, which is related to uh, the qualities of GPU that is high throughput, it's very good for parallel processing. You will see that GPU is being used a lot in machine learning. For example, libraries like TensorFlow and Python, they all have uh, support to use the GPU, uh, use GPU. and GPU uh, works with many cores and can do thousands of operations at the same time, although these operations are more simplified. So if I say that CPU is the brain, I would say that GPU would be the soul of the PC. Now we're going, so we talked about processing, but we have to put this data somewhere. So we're gonna talk about the storing. So going over the components of hardware in memory units, we have uh, types of stores. They are used for storing data and information, they are influenced by the latency and the architecture of the memory units, and they are related to types, for example, like HDD, SSD, run, and cache. Going over the first one, which is HDD and SSD, they are long-term storage. You can imagine like sometimes you are running your Python program and you modify a file. Uh, tomorrow you want this file to be modified. So you're definitely gonna be doing this on this type of storage. They are lower in speed write and read, so it's much slower than RAM. 
and run this slower than cache, we will see. And then we have caches, cache L1, L2, and L3. It's used to store the most frequently used data by the CPU, so if you're using a lot of this data, it will end up in the cache. And this fast is small compared to the RAM, and often uh, store the most often executed instructions, as I say. There is also the concept of cache hit and miss. So what's cache hit and miss? So a CPU goes and look in the cache. If it's uh, in the cache, it does a hit. If it's not in the cache, either it has to calculate it, compute it, or it has to look for uh, another lower storage uh, uh, unity. Uh, it would be the a miss. And the execution of your program also could depend on that, that if you had a lot of misses and it would end up not being so efficient. Uh, one of these uh, memory unities that is quite special is the RAM. The RAM is short-term memory. It stores data and objects that are currently used by the program. It is special for us because it's where the Python private heap space is located. We're gonna dive in on this concept. So if we go over the, how the CPU reaches the RAM, we would have CPU and we have cache in between and we have the RAM. And as long as we go in this line, things start to get uh, slower to retrieve. So it's not, it's not so efficient to go to run always. So what we are going in the Python world and trying to find a Python abstraction layer compared to the hardware. So we have it here, the RAM. The room is special, as I said, because it has the Python private heap space. The name private, it means that it, it will be Python which will manage the, this heap space, heap space, not you. Because some of the programming language allows that you do this manipulation and try to find a performance uh, efficiency there. So part of the memory that is managed by Python is located in the pri private heap space. You can think is, is where, when Python is running, things go and be saved there. So as we know in Python, everything is an object. And when I mean that, we have lists, dictionaries, and set, and there are all objects which will be uh, stored in the private heap space. And we have here two keywords, would be the Python's memory manage and the garbage collection. When we talk about the Python's memory manage and the garbage collect, there will be the ones who kind of garbage collect, will clean up things for you, remove objects that are not used, and the memory manager will try to allocate and deallocate it, uh, memory space. So in between Python and the run, memory manager will be a friendly robot like doing this cleanup for us. We could think about the memory manage like for example, I live in a small apartment, so I would love to have such a robot that could put the things that I want in the right places. And once that notices that I'm no longer using something, uh, tell garbage collector, invoke garbage collector, remove that, and re free up that space for a new thing. And that's how you could think about memory management. And so memory management, manage memory inside the private heap space, uh, works together with garbage collector. So uh, Yulia will talk more about garbage collector. But yeah, memory manage will basically do the allocation and free up of space depending on the state of the application. So there are a lot of things here related to hardware that we learned today. Uh, this is just a recap from the first part. But the most important thing is that or our code is not isolated. It runs in a machine, and these things are also related to the performance. So, so main components we saw it was computing units and memory units and how they communicate, and some of the types of memory that we saw. Also that all objects are stored in the private heap space. And the private heap space is managed by a little friend memory manager. So this is, uh, this is it for the first part, and Yulia will talk more about some of these concepts here. Thank you. So as Liza already mentioned, what is going outside our Python and how it can influence our performance, but let's talk about what's actually going inside our Python and how basically Python interacts with our RAM and what, can help, what helps him to do this. As we know, our Python is high-level programming language. It means that it takes for us overhead for, mem for managing memory, for locating memory and freeing memory. And basically, this is done based on two strategies. 
The first strategy is reference counting. Maybe a lot of you already heard this because this word is, comes very, very often here. Another very nice that word, as also everyone know, is garbage collector. But why this thing is important? As we know, first of all, reference counting is basically a field that will represent how many different uh, objects reference to our object. And is it right now in use? For this is one important thing that is usually property of the object. That's why in Python everything is the object. It means we have representation for the code, function, non, integer, also container data types, such as list, set, uh, tuple, and so on. That's why when you execute your program, what Python does, it will parse your code, uh, classes, functions, methods, everything, constants as object it will keep in the uh, private heap space and depends on the state it will recall it and use it. But what actually, why it's important? If we have a look on the C Python, it's basically here we have some representation. And we can see on the top we have one important thing. It's basically pi object. Pi object is pi object that was inherited from, it's the object from where all objects are inherited, two fields, reference count and also type. And basically depends of these uh, fields and prop in values of these properties, uh, Python knows what to do. For example, uh, we have pi float object, pi module object, pi long object, pi set objects that inherit these properties. And also, for example, here we can also see pi var object. In case of pi var object, it knows, uh, it's used for definition of the length. So for example, for lists and tuples, if you want to use, um, if you want to use, uh, to know the length, you can say function when, it's when uh, basically we have this field and we inherit it from pi list object and pi tuple objects. So to know that it's, uh, because these objects will use for keeping our object and size can change during execution. And let's look uh, better clues on this. Uh, for example, we have a small example here that we assigned float object with have statements that we assign float to our variable a. What's basically happening inside our Python? We will have the object will be represented as follow with the three properties, value, type, reference counts. Value basically is the value it has. Type is basically gives information Python uh, how to thread this uh, object. For example, it knows that it's a float, what kind of the method it can interact. Additionally, how we can place this memory, how it, we should place memory for this, because uh, for some kind of execution, Python use fixed memory location. It means depend on the type, it knows how much memory we need this, this object needs. And reference counts basically indicates that one object right now reference to this, uh, to this uh, one reference, this object has one reference. And these two fields, type and reference counts, basically are inherited from pi object. Also, do not always pass the pointer of the memory. Python use variables where basically variables will serve as labels on the pointers. And this we know that by variables we can reference to our object inside the memory. For example, here we have the example that we assign now 3.5 to B, and we know that uh, A and B will reference to the same very object, even they will assign a different uh, statements, because it was already exist in memory, and also we see that reference counts will increase. But let's have a closer look what's going on inside our memory during execution. We can see that during, uh, for example, we have two uh, statements, A assign, three assigned to A and six assigned to A as well. And during execution, we see when we assign A, what it does, it will create the object inside our memory. Value three and uh, type in and reference count one. After that, when execute the following, we will not change the old object, but instead we create a new object with value six type in reference count one. And the, for the old object, we can see that we decrease our value because it never in use. And usually with constant data types, it will not modify the object, but instead creates a new one and abandon the old one. 
In case we have more uh, complicated, immutable uh, objects, for example, list is immutable object, and we are hiring for pi list objects. And usually, uh, list represent with the following types. It has reference count that indicates that one variables in reference to our object. Size is how many uh, items in our size. And also allocated. It means how much memory we allocate for our uh, list. Usually, for list, it can sometimes allocate more memory to avoid, it's also for optimization purposes, do not always reallocate memory for our list. It, at some point of time, can allocate more. But what is important is that vector pointers. Usually, what is the indicate? It indicates the address of the memory where we keep array of pointers that basically will indicate to the objects that included in this array. For example, we know in the list we can get in, flow out, object, instances, and a lot of different stuff. It's, that's why it's possible, because basically on low level, we will keep not uh, exactly object in the vector and array. We keep just pointers of them. For example, here we can see that we will keep pointer to the integer one and to the integer two. It gives us, us great possibility, but in, in sometimes it can be also punishment for us. For example, we have again our example that one and two assigned to B, list of one and two. Again, we create the type uh, object type of list in our memory and we have this indication in our memory. After that, we append again new value. We can see that our list now reference count increased to two because now list refers to itself we can see the size also increase, and basically right now we have two references to our list, from B and itself. And now after some execution, we realize we don't need any more our list, and we decided to remove references to it. In our, our opinion, we thought it was removed, but actually no. Because reference count just decreased by one, but actually there are still references in our uh, code, is basically list reference itself. And after execution, some kind of code, you in this thing, it's called circle of references. Basically, it's what keep can promote have uh, problems with the memory because in case um, garbage collector, in case reference count doesn't reach zero because zero is also important value for a garbage collector. Garbage collector relies on re reference counts to understand if it's reach zero. It means you can collect our objects. In case with reference counts, in this case we don't re refer, uh, do not reach one because reference count doesn't give, like doesn't give us possibility to do. So in this case we can have the memory states as follow. We can see that reference count zero for obsolete object of int. We still have a new object here, uh, zero uh, object int. It's good for us. And what is next one? We have the old our list int. Okay, but after some execution of the memory, we don't need this, and what actually we need to do with this, uh, what actually we can do with them. And what has happened actually to our all objects? And what's happened actually to our ob all objects is basically garbage collector takes care of it. Basically garbage collector run alongside your, mem uh, your application and takes care for our memory. For example, it can, uh, it basically collect your uh, all, uh, old objects and also uh, solve problem, um, solve problem res circle references. And, we also can interact with this by, for, uh, for example, we can trigger it or also we can enable it, disable it. We can also set up threshold if, for example, you want to run it more often. Uh, for this, you did need to use the module GC. Also in GC, it's possible to check how many object refers to your object as well. And it's very, it can be used for debugging. But as we know, C is, so uh, garbage collector also can be quite consuming because it's always check your uh, all objects that we have. That's why there's in garbage collector we have so-called generations. Basically generation will represent uh, disjoint sets, disjoint lists of objects. In, um, in Python we have generation zero, we can, uh, generation one and generation two. 
And the idea of the generation depends on which your object, in, in which generation your object is, how often will a garbage collector check if we need to collect information, if we need to reveal a memory for this object. It's not more in use. For example, we have generation zero where all newly created objects are safe. It means in this generation, we keep only objects that we consider will not uh, retain long in our uh, memory. For example, we have function, we call our function with some pass some parameters after execution, we don't need this or uh, parameters, it was created some objects inside. And to be sure that we execute our program fast, usually uh, this kind of temporal short long object place in generation zero. If they su survive after being some time in generation zero and some cycles of uh, garbage collector cycle, they promote it to generation one. And basically in generation one, there's no big difference. The difference is here is just um, garbage collector will not so often check these objects because it understands that they, this object can be retained longer for a longer time. There's no uh, point of collecting them or uh, revealing the memory. And the finally, we have generation two. It's also basically all the objects that survive inside generation one. And this also creates long-term, uh, Python consider as long-term objects that will not, um, they can, for example, global variables that will never ex 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 exit your program. You never uh, need to free uh, memories of it. And also garbage collector do not need to always check it. That's why in generation two, most, most of the time we'll keep the long-term project uh, objects that will not, um, that we don't need to check so need to check so often. And after execution of the memory, as we recall, we have this nice graphic that represents the type of the list. We have also our old list that we don't need anymore. We also have our int that we don't need anymore. And also we have new int. And after execution of the garbage collector, usually Byte uh, garbage collector reference to this value zero that it's no, 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 more, no more in the use. It means that there's no references and it will remove it because reference count of zero. It means we don't need it anymore, it's removed. But again, we also have this list and even we don't use it, we understand there's nothing here that refers to it, but we still have this reference count. That's why in the Python there's another strategy. It's called mark and sweep. What it means? So basically, uh, at this point, what garbage collector does, it will collect all global variables, all local variables. And it's used to understand what of the objects are reachable or not reachable. It means that there are some objects that are reachable from our program, and there are some prior, uh, objects that are not reachable. That's why it will use global variables and local variables as root, vari uh, as root and will go through these references inside our uh, 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 private, uh, uh, private, uh, private Python private heap to mark it as reachable. And after going through all these references, it know what is object are reachable or not reachable. Reachable object, it means we can reach it from global variable or local variable is still reaches this uh, object. In case it's not reachable, it's just remove it. It means there's no of global variables or local variables are referred to values. And after this, we can see that its strategy will help you to remove also our obsolete list because no variable there is that reach it, uh, is reached this object. And if you can recap what you think need to uh, think about Python and when you work with Python, it's also quite important. Maybe it's just first step to understand how we can uh, better use it. It gives you better understanding of it. It's basically, you don't need only to think about how you write your code, what line of your code, but also you can think about your execution. Remember that everything is object inside a Python, so even you have obsolete code that you think I never going to use it, it will not consume my memory, it will consume your memory, at least RAM memory, because your function class will be kept inside your Python as object. Objects are stored in private heap, and basically who is mem managing this private heap is memory manager, is a part of C Python that, uh, as abstract level that helps to manage memory. 
And basically, uh, memory manager relies on the reference coding in the garbage collector to collect this data, to, co uh, to reveal the memory. And if you want to learn more, one of the good important sources is memory management in Python, C internals, high performance uh, Python, and also good talks in mo about immortal objects and pointers in my point, uh, Python. And thank you for your attention. Wow. <clears throat> so, thank you very much for this beautiful insights into Python memory management. So, I think the last time I heard heap management or heap memory was when I did my better programming, so quite interesting. Um, I've not seen questions on Discord, but we are now entering Q&A session, so um, feel free to come here to the microphone and ask your questions to the speaker. Or you can talk us first. Or you can talk to us. Of after. course, but we nice. got the uh, um, option for um, 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 asking the speakers. And if there are not no questions from the audience, um, I got at least one uh, question. And um, at least I'm remembering when you're um, executing um, C code when you're compiling it. So there will be some um, optimization. So yep. in Python. Can I expect that the code will run the same way or the memory will be the same way always or are there some optimization mechanisms? No, not, it's not always. Uh, can you repeat your question again? So are there any um, optimization methods just in time in memory? So can I expect that the code will be, or the memory will be managed every time the same way? So. Um, is there some optimization or behind the scenes or? I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's good. Uh, it's good question. Like basically, um, what you need to, uh, for example, please you need to give properly, some. Yeah. Um, the you, speakers have still a Q and yeah. A session, uh, and it's impolite. So, for that example, you're not uh, quiet. Please, so, when you want to leave the room, please yeah. do it quiet. Thank you. Uh, so one of the most important things when you uh, work with Python, you need to understand, as I mentioned, that what of the Py object is using is type to understand how to uh, how to locate memory for your object. That's why if you check a lot of articles, it mentions why you need to understand data structure. But because it depends on your data structure, interaction of data structure, Python will reveal memory for it. For example, that's why tuple are more better suitable for the objects that will not change over execution, because it knows that you do, doesn't need to relocate memory. So it's why tuple is better than list. In case the list is also more flexible because it knows that you will insert some values, that's why it, Python considers these facts. That's why when you're writing your code, uh, check, for example, data structure. Check also cleanliness of your code. Do not use global variables because global variables always retain your memory. It's also too good to use slots. What else? So, uh, oh, that's sorry. Do always <coughs> memory profiling before optimization. Exactly. Cool. Thank you very much. And no speaker leaves the stage without cookies. I hope you love cookies. So here are the cookies for the speaker. Thank oh, you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.